23, um, the panels that were in Berlin were cleaned. And all of a sudden, they uncovered the inscription that you see above in Latin, and it got translated for you. This inscription, for the first time, suggested that Hubert van Eyck is the real artist here, and that he was the first in art, as it said, and that Jan, his brother, was the second in art and actually finished the painting. This was absolutely earth-shattering. In 1823, this rocked the art history world. An equivalent might be all of a sudden we cleaned the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and there was a little note that said, this is by Michelangelo and Larry Buonarroti. <laughs> And um, it had the same sort of effect. No one had ever heard of Hubert Van Eyck before, so all of a sudden they had this master who um, was, according to the inscription, even greater than Jan Van Eyck, who in the 19th century was the single most desired, most expensive painter um, anywhere in the world, far more so even than Raphael and Michelangelo. So scholars went around looking for um, anonymous 15th century French paintings to assign to Hubert Van Eyck. Uh, for lack of a, a better idea, how could this great artist have left nothing except the Gantaltaries? But there are those who thought that this is a 16th century forgery. Um, and still to this day, there's not a single extant work that is definitively attributed to Hubert Van Eyck. All that we do know is that there was an artist whose name was roughly Hubert Van Eyck. It might have been Ubrecht or Ubrecht, but the spelling was, uh, was flexible at the time, who was living and painting in Ghent in the appropriate time, around the 1420s. But this fellow died in 1426, which is generally agreed upon as the starting date for the painting of the Gandalfis. Therefore, we can calculate that while Hubert Van Eyck was commissioned to paint the Gandalfis, he died so soon after the process began that even if he had made headway, what we see today can only be the hand of young Van Eyck and that Jan van Eyck was given permission to finish the work of art by Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy, presumably because Duke Philip had the idea of using the Gantalta piece in some symbolic way. He couldn't have known that, that um, six years later he would give birth to his first son, but in some sort of ceremonial um, procession. So the first mystery was who actually painted it. And to this day, um, if you look at half the art history books and half the guide books, about half say that it's by Jan van Eyck and half say that it's by the Van Eyck brothers. So the next in the series of crimes actually is attempted iconoclasm destruction. There were a series of riots in the city of Ghent um, on the part of Calvinists um, rebelling against the ruling Catholics. And I always think the idea of rioting Calvinists sounds really odd and silly to me. But there you go, they were really causing all sorts of trouble, trying to destroy as much Catholic art as possible. Uh, and the Catholic uh, rulers of Ghent recognized that the Ghent altarpiece would be the logical object to attack. They're trying to destroy Catholic art. This was already the most famous painting in Europe. Um, it was famous as a Catholic icon, um, a bastion of Catholic mysticism. And part of the, the objections of Protestants is that people were um, praying to works of art, not praying through them. And that this represented also the Catholic sin of indulgences that the people who paid for the altarpiece, Josef and his wife, were essentially bribing their way to the fast track into heaven by commissioning this great work of art. So it had to be destroyed. So if you can imagine that the 16th of April, 15, uh, August rather, 1566, um, the Catholics actually set up a bodyguard inside the cathedral of St. Babel. And it was a bodyguard of knights who were determined to defend the death of the Gandalfapiece. And they locked the cathedral doors. And the riots were taking place outside. You can imagine the sound of, of falling timbers and burning masonry, and how nervous the knights must have been inside with their sweaty hands on their sword hilts. And the rioters tried to open the door, but they couldn't get in. And eventually the riots died down the next morning. But the knights had a sense that the rioters would be back maybe the very next night. They returned. This time they had a tree trunk strapped with ropes to use as a battering ram. And they broke through the door of St. Baba Cathedral, and rushed through the cathedral. You can imagine their torches flickering against the masonry of the cathedral walls in the night. And they ran to the Yosemite Chapel, and they were prepared to drag the altarpiece out into the courtyard and to make a bonfire out of it. When they got to the chapel, the altarpiece was gone. And in the heat of the night, perhaps they didn't have time to think twice. Maybe they thought it was divine intervention. But they destroyed pretty much everything else that they could get their hands on, but they didn't find the altarpiece. And little did they know that it was only a few meters away from them. 
It had been dismantled, and the individual panels had been hidden at the top of the bell tower of the cathedral. And the very nervous knights were waiting in the spiral staircase of the bell tower with the door closed, hoping that they wouldn't try the door. Um, and they were prepared to defend the Gandalf but they didn't need to. And there soon after, um, the Catholics were returned to power, and the Gandalf peace was returned to its place. But this was one of the early misadventures of the altar piece, and it narrowly escaped destruction on a number of occasions. I mentioned already the visit of the rather foolish. Oh, here we have. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the engraving of the Gandalf iconoclast. Of Calvinist rites, a cathedral demolishing all the Catholic iconography that can get their hands on. And here I already mentioned the rather prurient um, Emperor Joseph II, you have him here, um, who didn't, uh, we're not sure if he ordered the removal of the Adam and Eve panels, but it's certain that the panels were removed immediately after his visit, and they were actually stored in the cathedral archives. And it was only a hundred years later that replacement copies were painted. And if any of you studied art history, say, 30 or so years ago, you probably saw replacement copies in your art history book where an artist has painted copies with bare skin covering all the naughty bits on um, Adam and Eve to prevent um, an upset like Emperor Joseph had. I should go back for just a minute. The next step in the story is actually related to Napoleonic art movement. Napoleon, along with Hitler, the two of them vied for the, the title of king among art foods, but their theft methods were institutionalized, and it was a, a matter of policy, military policy. And we have Napoleon to thank for um, a new military policy that would be followed up in the First and Second World Wars, that of stealing art at an institutional level. And Napoleon established what is the first art theft unit, military unit, um, in 1794. Um, when Napoleonic troops in the, under the French Republican Army first, rather than the Imperial Army later on, um, captured the city of Ghent, and they stole the central panels of the altarpiece in 1794. We're not sure why they didn't also take the wing panels. But when they shipped them back to Paris, the first director of the movement, a guy called Dunon, who was Napoleon's mastermind art thief, he was sitting um, back in Paris when he wasn't traveling with Napoleon, coming up with an art historian's dream wish list of every work of art that he would love to have in the newly converted movement, and he got a great many of them. And a surprising number are actually still there today. Um, the movement did return some works, but quite a few of them, including uh, a work by Van Eyck, that were stolen during the French Napoleonic era, actually were never returned, so some of them are still at the movement today. Um, he was very upset when he saw that only the central panels were stolen. This is kind of like stealing the Venus de Milo minus the head. You can imagine it would not be very satisfying, so he immediately uh, snapped into action. Um, but it was politically awkward to just steal the wing panels, so he tried to swap some Rubens paintings. He figured Rubens from Antwerp, that's right next to Ghent, they're all, they all speak Flemish over there. Um, but they would have none of it because already the Ghent altarpiece had come to symbolize not just the Ankenite, not just the city of Ghent, but Catholicism and surviving the attacks against it. Um, the area known as Flanders that would eventually become Belgium, it became a real battle standard, but too often it also became the rope in a tug of war between nations who unfortunately used uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, just like they used Alsace and Lepen in France, as the battlefield for the great powers of Europe. So unfortunately, this was caught in the fire, and this would be stolen at every opportunity when an invading power took over this area. So Napoleon established the precedent that art could be stolen, um, or he would say appropriated, as terms of armistice. And in the armistice with the Duke of Modena, who was the first of his Italian opponents to fall in the Italian campaign, he said that he gets to choose 20 pictures from the Duke of Modena's collection, along with manuscripts um, that would be part of the terms of satisfying uh, the armistice. Napoleon stops killing you if and you hand over part of your art collection. This has become a hot topic of debate recently with discussions of who owns cultural heritage and national patrimony. And this really begins back with Napoleon in 1796. And of course, Napoleon's art theft unit packed up 20 pictures and then took some more. And some individuals stole, uh, helped themselves to prints and drawings and pictures. And then Napoleon showed up to stop all the looting and decided that he quite liked some of the like, very large realistic paintings. That was his main criteria, and he stole some of them for himself. And the